Hello, today is January 30th, 2015. We're meeting today with Mr. Harold Beal at his home in Longmont, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Harry, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. I was born in November 3rd, 1920 in Clearwater, Kansas. That's about 20 miles southwest of Wichita. And uh, my mother and father uh, were operating at a wrestling when I was born. And my mother died when I was a year and a half old and I went to live with an aunt and uncle. My uncle was a veterinarian. They're, they're once again still in Clearwater, or yes, still okay, in Clearwater. okay. And uh, then, uh, in later years, my father ran a filling station, and uh, I went to the Clearwater schools. Then the times were pretty tough in those times, and uh, so when I went to Wichita University, I enrolled in ROTC in order to help pay for my education. And uh, I had always been a hunter. My father was a hunter. And I'd always been around guns. And so uh, I, I did fit in quite well with the program in, uh, in uh, ROTC. And uh, I completed four years at the university and uh, majored in zoology. And uh, of course, being in <clears throat> ROTC, I was then appointed as a second lieutenant in infantry. Now, what, what time period, what, what year did you graduate for, I, what were your college years then? I graduated in 1942. Okay, so you were in college uh, when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Yes. Do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about that? No, I don't remember. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, I, I don't remember anymore, but it was a terrific event. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> on graduation uh, in uh, June of 1942, uh, six days later, I ended up in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And uh, I, of course, was in the Army and went through Armored Force School. And uh, after graduating from Armored Force School, they sent me along with lots of other fresh second lieutenants to the Moabi Desert. We trained with the 3rd and the 5th Armored on the desert in tanks and half tracks and, uh, and uh, other and, uh, uh, ordnance equipment. Then uh, <clears throat> when we left the desert, uh, I was on the cadre to the 15th Armored in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. I'm sorry, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And so uh, I went to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and uh, I was in headquarters trains company there, and I enjoyed my time. However, I had the notice on the bulletin board, a letter that said that they were hurting for pilots and they needed pilots in the Air, Air Corps, and if you could uh, fly, uh, if you could pass a physical, you could transfer over to the Army Air Corps without going through channels. And uh, having flown once in a little airplane, uh, it uh, intrigued me, so. So you'd, you'd been in an airplane before? You said you'd flown before? Yes, I, I had been a passenger in a Stagger Wing Beechcraft airplane at uh, Wichita Airport. Uh, my dad took me up one time and we flew with somebody. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I transferred over to the Army Air Corps, and uh, my first assignment was at Muskogee, Oklahoma, and uh, we had private uh, citizens there who acted as our pilots, and uh, we trained there in, in uh, Fairchild PT-19, airplanes. They were all wood and fabric and 
Ranger engines. <laughs> and uh, from there we went to the BT-13, which was a metal, mostly metal airplane at uh, Arkansas City, Kansas, which was not too far from where I grew up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, after we went through the that uh, program, we went to our uh, final program at Aldous, Oklahoma. And uh, there, of course, we had twin-engine Cessna Bobcats, which were made in Wichita, which was not far from my grip. And uh, we uh, finally graduated from the Aldous program and went to Bergstrom Air Force Base. And on my way to Bergstrom Air Force Base, I went home and was married and married my daughter, or my uh, uh, good friend, Shirley, who I grew up with wow. in school. And we met when she was in the sixth grade. <laughs> wow. And so she went with me and we went to to uh, Bergstrom to train in C-47s. Now, did you uh, did you request a, a, a multi-engine, or were no, you just assigned to that? I we mean, were selected to multi-engine, I think, probably in our primary program, and I think it was probably done on the basis of what the private pilots thought okay. we could better accomplish, and uh, why I didn't get into fighters instead of twin engine. I have no idea. Mm, okay. But anyway, that's where I ended oh, okay. up. Okay. So yeah, you didn't request that you were just put into that. That's right. Okay. Okay. And uh, so we lived in Bergstrom and, uh, uh, or we lived in uh, Austin, Texas and went, uh, we're at Bergstrom Field and uh, we trained in C C DC-3s mostly and our uh, instructors were former airline pilots mm. there. And uh, then uh, after training there, we went to Camp McCall. And uh, I can't tell you exactly where that was in the South anymore, but we were there for a while. And my wife stayed in Southern Pines while I was at the field in there. Then our next move was to, uh, I, I think these, this is the right uh, sequence. We went to Knob Nostra, Missouri. And my wife and I stayed in, a, in one room in a home in Sedalia for a few days and then moved into the upstairs of a building adjacent to the theater in Knob Nostra, Missouri, where the airfield was, and uh, we enjoyed going to the movies a lot with popcorn, mm -hmm. and uh, we did a lot of practice at uh, Knob Noster, uh, pulling gliders, one glider, two gliders, dropping paratroopers, and uh, so finally we, it was time to leave Knob Noster, and Shirley went home, and uh, my dad came up helped her pack up everything and drive back home. And uh, then... Was it was that tough to, to, to leave? Were you heading for overseas at that yeah. point? Was that tough? Uh, a tough... Uh, it had to be tough well, leaving, I mean, quite frankly, not knowing what, where you were going and what, could, what the future uh, held, really. Well, I, I guess it was, but, you know, uh, we, we were looking forward to doing something. Mm. So that kind of took the edge off okay. of it for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure my wife was uh, maybe not the same way. But anyway, she went home and we then went to Bearfield, Indiana and picked up brand new airplanes. And uh, I, uh, from there we started overseas and my partner, my airplane was uh, 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 a boy from Kansas City, and uh, he and I both had about 250 hours of flying time when we left 
Bearfield and headed south. And our, uh, at that time, we were with the 100th Troop Carrier Squadron. Uh, uh, it was in the 441st Group, 100th Squadron. And uh, we all took off individually uh, and flew south to Florida. And we stayed at uh, uh, Homestead Field on the south end of Florida for a couple of days. And the mosquitoes just about carried us away. Is that right? <laughs> and, uh, then our next lap was to Puerto Rico. And, uh, uh, we flew across the water to Puerto Rico, and uh, we didn't have any problems. And I still remember uh, the beautiful view out of the Officers Club in Puerto Rico. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful place. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So then we left and headed south, and our next uh, two laps were over jungle and. Uh, uh, it's a little bit scary to be flying over just green everywhere. There wasn't, wasn't any place a person could put an airplane down if they wanted to land. So then we went on south and and I, I can't remember, we went to Natal and Belém. That's in Brazil, correct? Yes, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you which one's the north one, which one's the south one, I don't remember. And at each location we stayed overnight. And uh, I might mention that we made these long laps. We had extra fuel tanks in our co in our airplanes. They called them Bolera tanks, and uh, they were uh, big barrels that were in the fuselage and they gave us added distance. And in our airplane, we had two Bolera tanks, a jeep, and several people. Really. And, yeah. uh, Another thing I noticed down on the, the uh, 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 South American places, the, 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 so many of the people out on the field wore a fez, and I'd never seen anyone wear one of those. Before. Well, I, I can only imagine. I mean, here's this small town Kansas boy down in the jungles of Brazil and in Puerto Rico and Florida. It must have been just exciting. <laughs> well, it was exciting. Yeah. Yes, it was all new experience yeah, yeah. for us. And, and we left then uh, South America to head for the east, and we went to Ascension Island. And uh, they had uh, just a little beacon on Ascension Island. But uh, we started out, uh, uh, my partner and I, and we, over these long trips, you know, of several hours, a lot of times one of us would take a little nap and we'd just get out of the seat and sit behind the, the seat. And uh, we used automatic pilot a lot on the long trips. And uh, on this flight from uh, uh, South America to Ascension Island, uh, I took a little nap behind the seat and uh, when I woke up, my partner was asleep, <laughs> and the plane was flying on automatic pilot. So we finally calculated where we were, and, and uh, to the best of our knowledge, we were probably off course about 60 miles, but we did get to Ascension Island. Boy, I always, I've always been am <laughs> amazed by that pathway, how, how you guys with the technology could find this little dot out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to land at. It, uh, well, uh, uh, we, we should have been on our toes, but we, <laughs> we weren't. Anyway, we landed at Ascension Island and refueled there. And then our next stop, uh, and our, our next uh, uh, trip east, we hit Dakar, North Africa. Wow. And uh, we did not stop there. We went on north to Marrakesh. And we stayed at Marrakesh for a day or two. And I saw my first Arabs with turbans. Oh, wow. And I even bought a purse from one of them for my wife, made out of goat skin, and she used it for many years. Uh. We left Marrakesh to 
too courtly owed to you, which he set on the coast and refueled and then went to England and we had to avoid uh, Spain and Portugal, so we went out beyond them. And we went to a base called Langerfield in England and it was uh, uh, near Nottingham. And uh, there uh, at that field we again did an awful lot of uh, glider tow and uh, uh, dropping paratroopers. Uh, and uh, we pulled not only the CG-4A uh, US gliders, but also the horse gliders the English had. We didn't get to see Robin Hood while we were at Nottingham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then it came time for the invasion. And so we went down to Taunton. And then on the invasion, we left Taunton at night in formation. And uh, I led, as a pilot, uh, 13 ships. We were supposed to cross the uh, coastline of France at 1,200 feet, and uh, we got there all right, but at 1,200 feet, we were in the clouds. Wow. Oh, boy. At night, uh, in formation, uh, is not too good a place to be. Oh, boy. <laughs> so uh, everybody went down, and of course, that wasn't too good for the formation, but at least we we got below. And I never forget when we opened, when we got below the clouds, and we were in searchlights, and I had never seen them before. Oh. And they were so bright that you could look out the window of the airplane and see the, this black smoke from the projectors out there exploding. The flak. And yes, and so that that's pretty hard on a formation, you know. And I understand that the paratroopers were all disgusted because they didn't all end up the right place. But you know, uh, uh, under those circumstances, there just wasn't any way everybody could stay where they wanted to be. Right, right. So we dropped down to about 600 feet and uh, got below the clouds there, and then. Then we, to the best of our knowledge, went on to, to our designated drop zone. I, I can only imagine, that must have been terrifying, being shot at, and I mean, it was, what well, was the... Well, it made you pretty nervous. Oh. <laughs> when we got to the drop zone, we dropped them all but one, and he had been shot uh, when we were over the, the lights. There was a tremendous amount of anti-aircraft fire and lights there. And uh, uh, we, uh, after we dropped the troopers, we, we kind of tried to ass uh, uh, assess what condition we were in. And we had one engine that we had to feather the prop on. So we were flying on one engine the controls were not too good. And uh, so we had a choice of heading for home or jumping out. And we decided we'd try to make it home. So wow. we did fly at about 500 feet all the way home. And of course, most of our flying was down on the deck anyway, because that was our only protection, you know. We didn't have any hand aircraft or any turrets or. Uh, uh, weapons to right. fire against a fighter and so we flew back at about 500 feet and got back to England and landed and uh, we brought it in as slow as we could which was fortunate because we found out we had two flat tires and so we ended up about 90 degrees to the runway they did uh, uh, go to work on her plane and Try to fix it up, and they, uh, there was a hole in the rudder you could walk through. Wow. Uh, two flat tires, and they patched over 400 holes from, uh, <laughs> uh, from projectiles. And one of my wingmen, 
uh, got back also to England and they salvaged his airplane. They didn't even fix it. And we lost one pilot and crew. And uh, I think, uh, uh, I, I forget the number of uh, C-47s that were shot down, but I think it was in, in around 40 to 50 on that maneuver. Mm. We lost Billy Connolly, a boy from Texas. So out of your out of your thirteen, you lost just the one. You lost the one plane. Well, out of our twenty some. Oh, okay. But it was the thirteen that you led. The thirteen that I led, he was not in my. Oh, okay. He oh, okay. was in the next one. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, uh, so uh, let's see. Then uh, uh, the uh, following day. Uh, the whole outfit went back in and flew in pulling gliders, the, and uh, I didn't, I couldn't go because I didn't have an airplane to uh, fly. And uh, so uh, that uh, from there, then uh, uh, we went back, of course, to our uh, field in Langer, Notting near Nottingham, England. We were there a, a few days, and then our next move was to Drew, France, and that's about 40 miles west of Paris. And it was a, a dirt field, and we lived there in tents, and we were there quite a long time. We'd go someplace else once in a while, but it seemed like we always came back there. And uh, we. Uh, we were there uh, for a while, and, and then we uh, went to Italy, and uh, we went to uh, Grosseto, Italy, which is on the west coast, right next to the, to the water, and it's north of Rome a ways, and uh, prepared for the invasion of southern France. And uh, for that invasion, we towed gliders. As I remember, it was a double glider tow. Hmm. And uh, we didn't have any uh, uh, damage from aircraft fire or anything that way that I know of. And uh, then after we left, uh, after that operation in Italy, uh, uh, well, while I was in Italy, uh, my, a friend of mine, Billy Connolly, who lived in, or, uh, Hank, Hank Comley, who lived in Wichita, the Comley Lumber Company there, he, he was in our outfit. And he and I uh, decided while we were there in, in uh, Italy to go north and see what the infantry was doing while we were waiting to go into southern France. So we, we wandered north and, and with an infantry outfit, we walked into Pizza. <laughs> we went through the railroad yards and through a railroad car into Pizza. And uh, it, by the time we got in there with this infantry outfit, it was night. And we huddled in the corner uh, of, a, of a doorway in a business district and heard gunfire all night. Oh, <laughs> next morning we went out with a supply wagon, <laughs> glad to go back home. Oh, <laughs> anyway, we saw it first hand. Wow. <laughs> uh, we, I, I guess we weren't very smart. <laughs> <laughs> and then after we left Italy, we went back to, uh, uh, to Drew. And uh, that was a, a, a pretty nice place. Uh, we slept in, in pyramidal tents. Uh, we had four or five to a tent. We were there long enough that we built floors and doors. And for heat, we cut wood around in the neighborhood. And, and, uh, but they were comfortable conditions? I mean, you were in fairly... At that age, yes. Yeah, at that age. <laughs> we slept on folding cots. And uh, water was in a blister bag. The men's or the uh, officers' mess was in a tent, and the men, the enlisted men, had a building they used. And, uh, 
and and how was the food? I mean, were you well fed and was how was yes, it? it was always plenty. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. And when they were, when you did get the food you wanted, there was always K rations around, and uh, of course they always included cigarettes too. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and. Well, then uh, uh, we started another a new practice, and that was uh, hauling fuel to Patton. Patton was moving east, and he couldn't keep enough fuel, so we would load a hundred uh, uh, hundred and twenty five gallon gas cans into each airplane, and and we would fly and land in a field along his route and uh, unload the cans so he could keep moving east. Hmm. And uh, at that time we had uh, some B-24s, uh, two or three of them on our field and they called them C-109s. They had taken the bomb bays and filled them up with gas tanks. And, but, uh, and we, we flew those, but uh, we never did deliver any fuel in them. So I got a little four engine training. How is that? Is it, is there a bit of difference between the two? I mean, or is it pretty much uh, just flying, uh, two flying? Com two cumbersome. Yeah, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. C-47, you can get it right down on the treetops. And, uh, and with it being a tail dragger, you can land it most anywhere. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. You know, with, with the nose wheel, then you're in trouble on bad fields. Gotcha, gotcha. And, uh, well, I, I got to ask you, I mean, when you were doing those those uh, uh, gasoline deliveries, I mean, it seems to me like you're uh, you're flying, a it's a flying powder keg that you're flying. I mean, that, that seemed kind of dangerous, and it seems like if you were landing ahead of Patton that you were almost flying into enemy zones, I mean, to... <laughs> To, to, to well, deliver. I don't know what the success rate was, but uh, I know of only one plane shot down uh, in our outfit, and uh, that was a boy by the name of Merrill Meeker from California, and a German fighter got him as he was landing. So you were still being harassed in the air. That we had total dominance of the air at this point. They oh, were no, still no, oh. no, no. Wow. That's the only one that I knew about. And, but uh, our main protection was altitude. And so we flew treetop to 5,000 feet most all the time. Hmm. In fact, we didn't have any oxygen, so. Couldn't go high. Couldn't then. go over 10,000. <coughs> and uh, then we did across the Rhine and some other things. I don't remember too much about some of those. Uh, uh, and then I guess about toward the end, we went on the nation over toward Bastogne, which was a kind of last push of the Germans. And During the Battle of the Bulge? Yes. And uh, we did end up with a hole in the fuselage. It was about two inches in diameter and it had a brass ring that stayed with the fuselage. And I don't know what it was, but it did explode. So we wow. were right. Oh boy. And on that trip, I remember we, we went front, we were surprised at a terrible noise. And, uh, so the crew chief went back to see what was going on. And <clears throat> or either the radio operator or the crew chief went back and found the other one that was standing in the open door back on the fuselage uh, using a submachine gun shooting at, <laughs> at the soldiers on the ground. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that was a glider tow rather than, than uh, paratroopers, but uh, I can't really remember for sure. We did a lot of glider towing, single and double. We even snatched gliders off the ground at one time. Oh, really? How, how would you how would how would well, you do that? There was a big winch inside the airplane, and the only one airplane I ever saw that we had that could do this. But 
it had a winch inside with a long cable on the winch. And then it, it went back to the, near the tail wheel and had a hook that dangled there. And it set up a glider and put a rope or a, a tow rope <coughs> above it uh, and uh, come down low and hook it with that uh, hook in the tail. Really? Huh? Yeah. You could take them off. It was quite a joke, you know. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> so that, uh, but of course the the tow cables were <clears throat> were flexible, and then the winch helped. And so we did that occasionally, but I never saw it happen in actual warfare. Uh, I think maybe some, just somebody's dream, and, but uh, it worked all right. Huh. And that just about finished off things, I guess, until the end of the war. And then uh, as soon as the war was over, they sent me to, to uh, Frankfurt. And my job there was to transport leave personnel. And uh, I transported them from Frankfurt down to Nice and Cannes and uh, back again. It wasn't a bit of fun. It was all spit and polish and uh -huh, right. on the minute, you know. Oh, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, a little bit more formal. We weren't quite used to that. It goes, we were flying usually just any way we wanted. Yeah, yeah. The main thing was get there if you can. And uh, we just do it any way you can. Yeah. Now, was there, now the, the war was still going on in, in the Pacific. Was there any thought of transferring you to the Pacific or? No, no one ever said anything. Oh, okay. About So then I uh, uh, was there in Frankfurt for a while, and then in September of 1945, they advised me that I was going to come home. And, uh, so they sent me to Stone, England, and I spent a week or two there waiting for uh, a Navy ship to take me to, to the States. And, uh, they uh, uh, assigned me to a bunch of enlisted personnel to supervise on the ship, and I don't really know why, because I didn't do anything except enjoy the milk and things that way I'd not seen for years, it seemed like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it took 10 days from Stone, England, to Boston Harbor. And how was that trip? I mean, here's a, here's a once again, a, a, a landlocked Kansas boy going to sea. How was that trip for you? Did you get your sea well, legs? And I, I, I didn't get seasick. And the ship was either a Liberty or a Victory ship, whichever was the smaller. I don't remember which it was. And, uh, but it just seemed endless. But the food was just wonderful. Oh, was it? Yeah. You know? yeah. So I had really enjoyed the trip. Well, well let, let, me, let me back up before we continue on with your story and back up into, into England or back to Europe. I mean, you were stationed in quite a few different places. During, when you were stationed, talk a little, one, about what you guys would do when you weren't on duty, and two, were you able to get out and explore a little bit and, and, and see the sites and meet the, the local civilians? Uh, talk a little bit about that, kind of. Yes, uh, in England, uh, we had an opportunity to go to London quite often. And also, when we were in Drew, France, uh, there were shuttles going back and forth so occasionally we had leave over there. In fact, at, at leave in London is when I bought most of my photography equipment. And then uh, when we were in Drew, France, we were 40 miles from Paris and we had a shuttle that ran to Paris every day. So uh, when we were there and not busy, we did spend a lot of time in France. Oh, in nice. Paris. nice. Oh. And that's a fine place to go. Yeah. Especially for a young fellow. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and while we were in Rome, we had a, we, uh, uh, we, we lived with a, an Italian family. Hmm. And we spent a lot of time, uh, uh, well, not, we weren't in Rome, we were in Grosseto. Mm -hmm. We spent, we, 
stayed with an Italian family, and we had an opportunity to go to Rome a lot. And uh, I even went down to Naples once and, uh, to pick up a, a barrel full of wine. Oh, really? <laughs> so, we, at our leisure time, we had tried to have a good time. Yeah, it sounded like it. And one thing I saw when I was in uh, uh, Rosetto that I found interesting. An old Italian invited me to come over to his house, and uh, so I went with him, and he, uh, we could converse pretty well, and it was just a nice home, two-story, only the, the, the family lived upstairs and all the animals were downstairs, <laughs> cows <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> I guess the heat from the cows probably kept the house warm. <laughs> uh, I've not seen that before. I'll be darned. Yeah, I, once again, I keep going back to this this small town Kansas boy. That I mean, I imagine growing up outside of you probably didn't travel too far away from home. I mean, maybe to Wichita was a big trip, but now here, all you've seen, uh, uh, you know, yes. South America, Europe. I mean, it just uh, must have been just a fascinating time. Well, it was. It's, we saw so many wonderful things too. The architecture. Places like uh, Italy and uh, England, and uh, it's just just remarkable hmm. all the beautiful things uh, that we saw. And uh, one thing too, uh, on the end of our takeoff run at Drew, France, was uh, a place called Chartres, and there was a cathedral there. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Hmm. We went, drove down there to visit inside. It was just so pretty. And of course, in all the beautiful things in not only London, but Rome. Mm. Rome, uh, they just let us go most anywhere we wanted. Mm. <laughs> so, being young, we did an awful lot of things we probably wouldn't have done when we were older. <laughs> <laughs> Talk, talk a little bit about uh, communications. I mean, in today's world, we've got cell phones and you know, computers. How was it with, with you and Shirley? Uh, talk about how you guys were able to communicate. Or... Well, we used uh, the mail. And the, the, uh, I guess it was the Army Mail Service was just excellent. How was it? Yeah? It was just, you know, the paper we wrote on was real, real thin, so that it take up much weight, and uh, I don't remember what we used in the way of postage, you may do it, didn't you? but anyway, we conversed with, uh, with uh, uh, only by mail. And how long normally would it take a letter to get back and forth? Was I don't remember. No, oh, okay. Yeah. Now, I, I, were you, I know with a lot of people, uh, over there, I don't know if it was the same with you. Were you uh, restricted as to what you could write? Was, were your letters censored? Yes, uh, uh, I don't know that anyone ever read one of my letters, but it was just understood that uh, you didn't put too much information about where you were or what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think everybody pretty much abided by that. And uh, I. Uh, I never heard of anyone having any problems yeah, in that yeah. regard. Yeah. <coughs> now, uh, I'd read in, in, in this piece you'd put together that uh, uh, while in Germany, you, you came across some old, uh, or some, some uh, German airplanes, one of them a jet. Talk a little bit about that. That must have yes, been. Yes, we did land at some airfield, and I don't know what it was, but there were German Stukas and Dormiers and <coughs> there was also a jet airplane there, and uh, it was, uh, uh, it, 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 I think it was Italian, but I, I wasn't positive about it. It was a fighter type airplane wow. with a jet, and uh, I, uh, I never got into any German aircraft. One aircraft that I don't know if I mentioned that I flew quite a bit was a P-47 Thunderbolt fighter. Really? Oh, really? We had, uh, at, the, at, at our base in 
Drew, we had two that two plane two fighters that had been retired from cert from the fighter group, but one of them was a P fifty one and the other was a P forty seven and the fifty one was pretty much reserved for the big brass and so I, I got to fly the forty seven. And and how was that? Well, it was fine. It was faster than anything I'd ever been in yeah. at 200 and something miles an hour. But I think the interesting thing about flying that was the the way that I learned how to fly. Uh, the only single engine plane I'd been in was uh, my basic and, and primary flight training. And I'd never been in a fighter before, so uh, uh, I forget who it was that was in charge of these planes, but he said, get in it and get acquainted with the, where the controls are, and, and I'll be back after a while. And so I did. I got in and looked around and found where the mixture and prop controls were and the throttle and all the instruments. and. and uh, and he came back and he said, now the stall speed is such and such. He said, take her off. And you know, you study airplanes for a long time sometimes before you switch to a different one. And here, <laughs> just no time at all, I was flying a fighter. But I, I, I enjoyed doing some aerobatics again, but I couldn't do loops, I couldn't hold it. Oh, uh, uh, there was just too much pressure. I could could dang handle that anymore. But I'd never been so fast before. Wow! <laughs> oh boy, but they were really. It, it was really nice to have them on the field. Yeah, I'll be done. So, how long altogether, roughly, were you overseas then? Yeah. Well, I can't remember when I went over, but I started back at uh, the last of September. In 1945. Okay. And uh, that's when I left. And I got home in October of, 55, of 1955. And, uh, so, uh, so I, I interrupted your story. We'll uh, we'll continue your story. You, you took the ship across. You landed. You said Boston Harbor. Yes, we yeah. landed in Boston Harbor. It took us ten days to come across. From Boston Harbor, we got off of the plane and walked uh, on ground right up to the railroad depot and right into the to the uh, railway cars, passenger cars, and the train headed west to Leavenworth, and we got off at Leavenworth, and we were discharged at Leavenworth. And during this time, were you able to get a hold of Shirley and tell you you're coming home, or did she know? Well, uh, I don't remember how and when I got a hold of her, but in any event, uh, her folks brought she and our daughter to meet me at Wichita. I got a, a bus from Leavenworth to Wichita, and that's the first time I'd seen my daughter. Oh, wow. Almost two years old. Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> And, uh, oh, that must have been a wonderful homecoming. So it was, a, it was a grand time. And then when I got home, uh, my wife and daughter had been living with their parents. And so I moved in too with them for a while. And then we got our own home. And uh, before the end of the year, I got home in October. Before the end of the year, I had a job working in a, in the country bank there in the town I grew up in. And I had a major in zoology in right. school, but you know, and pilots were a dime a dozen, and all coming back, so they didn't, the airlines didn't need all those. So I just took what was available and went to work in this bank. And Is that what you wanted to do as a, for your career then, uh, well, in banking? They that ended up as my career. I worked there for 15 years. Uh -huh. And uh, in the meantime, we had another uh, boy and a girl. And after 15 years, uh, we moved to Colorado and moved to Boulder. Now, what brought you out here to Colorado? I worked in Aurora for two years and lived in Boulder and drove back and forth. 
it, uh, what, was a bank down in? Yes. Okay. I, uh -huh. I was in the Bank of Aurora, and of course, the banks nowadays uh, change names regularly. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know what it is now. For a while, it was a United Bank. <laughs> and, uh, but after two years, I got a job in uh, Boulder. I, uh, when we lived in Boulder, my, my boy uh, wanted to carry papers on a paper route. And uh, it was a pretty long route, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll get him a scooter. So I saw one advertised in the paper, and I went to talk to this uh, fellow that uh, owned the scooter, and he said, yes, it did it belong to his boy, and that he uh, wanted to sell it for $200. And he said, uh, what do you do? I said, I work in a bank. Oh, he said, you do. And it happened to be that the fellow that had the scooter for sale was uh, Julius Kingdom, who was in the First National Bank in Boulder. So uh, I immediately opened an account in his bank. <laughs> uh, we became good friends, and I went to work for him, and I worked for for the first national at Arapaho National in Boulder. And then it turned into affiliated bank shares. And I worked for affiliated bank shares for 20 years. So altogether, how, how many years were you in the banking industry? 30, 30, let's see, 20, 30, about 35. Wow. And uh, I, uh, was in the bank at Arapaho National in Boulder for from uh, 60 t uh, yeah, 62 to 73 and then I went over to the First National in Louisville and was there from 73 to 82 and then I quit. Uh, I'll be darned. And uh, then uh, I've had a lot of good hobbies. What are some of your favorite? Well, I worked with leather for a while. I worked with jewelry for a while. I love working with silver. Oh, wow. And I've always enjoyed using my hands. And it worked out well because my wife was a potter and, and a painter. And so we had a lot of things in common. Oh, wow, wow. And um, so... <clears throat> Did, through the years, did you keep up your pri uh, pilot's license, or did you let that? I uh, I owned an airplane, uh, um, a Luscom, for a few years, and that was back in the early seventies. But I found that I just didn't have time to take care of it. I was just too busy working, mm -hmm. so I sold it. And but when I came home, I. Uh, flew in the Air Reserve. Uh, the uh, uh, Reserve would pick us up in a C-47 in Wichita and haul us to Kansas City, and we'd fly at Fairfax Field in Kansas City during the day, flying AT-6s, the old trainer. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they'd take us back home. And that went on until they ran out of money. Then they established an air reserve unit in Bo in uh, Wichita, and I joined that as soon as it started and uh, stayed with it until I moved to Colorado. They kept that unit in reserve during the Korean War. Oh, right. Oh, okay. And uh, then when I moved to Boulder, there was an air reserve unit there, and I stayed with that for several years. And Finally, I had too many good years, and they retired me in the reserve. Good. And staying in the reserve was probably the smartest thing I ever did. Yeah, yeah. Because it affords me uh, TRICARE coverage, health coverage, which right. can be a terrific advantage in these days. Right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've tried to keep in touch with 
various veterans organizations for a long while. I was in the American Legion and, and uh, we had an active chapter there in Clearwater where I and I went back after the service. And, uh, and I was a member in Boulder for some time. Uh, the Military Officers Association has a nice unit in Boulder. And so my needs are quite well taken care of. How about uh, keeping in touch? Uh, did you keep in touch with any, any of the guys you served with? Was there any sort of reunions uh, of, of, of like? Of they had reunions for a while. The only one that I attended was one they had in Wichita. And I can't tell you what year that was, yeah. but it was a long time ago. Sure, okay. And since that time, uh, it seems like everybody just dying off. Yeah. And yeah. right now, I only know of one person in our whole outfit that uh, is still uh, around, and he is in uh, Lebanon, Oregon, and just moved into the veterans home there. And his daughter says he's weak. Oh boy. Oh wow. So oh. I guess the ninety in the nineties. You have to expect some problems. Sure, you betcha. Yeah. And I've yeah. been most fortunate. I, I have good hearing aids from the VA, and uh, my eyes are, uh, I have both macular degeneration and glaucoma, but I can still see uh, pretty well. And I got my new driver's license in November. <laughs> So I'm fine till I'm 99. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I hope that I'll be smart enough to know when to quit. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, did, uh, over the years, did you and Shirley ever have a chance to travel back and kind of travel some of the paths you'd, you'd uh, been on, like in Europe? or? Uh... We went to Europe only once, and we went to Paris and stayed for 10 days. And we didn't get out in the countryside. We were in Paris almost exclusively. Okay. But we did go to Hawaii. And uh, in 1962, uh, I uh, attended a, a, a sales pitch on timeshares in Denver. And I bought a timeshare in Kauai. And we made 18, I think, trips. Uh, nice. In Hawaii. And uh, in the later years, we'd stay two weeks in our timeshare and two weeks in Haldekoa. And uh, we really enjoyed uh, Hawaii. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice place to go. Yeah. And we also spent a lot of time in southwestern Colorado. Shirley uh, was interested in archaeology as well as pottery. And so we were quite close to. Of those kind of operations mm -hmm. in Taos, Santa Fe, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said uh, Shirley passed away in 2010? 2010. 2010. Yes. How many years altogether were you married then? Well, we were married in, uh, in uh, October of 1943, and she passed away in February. Of, 67 years. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, 2010. Wow. So that's quite wow. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, we got to know each other pretty well. <laughs> and we have three children, uh, a daughter who lives in Steamboat, a daughter who lives here in Longmont, and a son in Colorado Springs. And grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Yes, we got uh, seven grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Mm. And I've really enjoyed the honor flight trip. Uh, I would have never gone back there. I have no real desire for the East. Yeah. I like the Southwest, but not the East. And so I would have never gone except for the honor flight. And it was a wonderful trip. Oh, I wonderful. really enjoyed it. But in addition to that, uh, meeting some local veterans and having lunch with them uh, uh, once a month has really been wonderful for me. 
most of the ones that went on my flight now are gone, but there are a few still left. And uh, we we meet once a month, and it's just it's been great. Oh, oh excellent, great. excellent, excellent. Well, Harry, as we start to wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any other stories that have kind of floated to the top of, as we've been sitting here talking that you wanted to talk about? Or do you think we've uh, pretty much rounded out your story? Anything you can think of that we had, didn't touch on? Oh, I think we've rounded it out <clears throat> just about as well as we can. Uh, if there are other things, I can't think of them right now. Yeah, okay. okay. After all, at 94, you know, <laughs> a person forgets an awful lot of stuff. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, I, I try not to exaggerate things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I enjoyed my time in the service. I, I, I never have regretted being in the service for almost four years. And you retired a lieutenant colonel, is that yes, correct? Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, I'm careful not to mention my rank at the, at our regular meetings, luncheon meetings, because there are some in our group that are somewhat allergic to, <laughs> to rank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, I had some wonderful experiences. And, and that's, that's usually my last question I like to ask with these interviews. How do you think that time uh, that you served in the military, particularly your World War II experience, how did that play a role in your life, change your life, affect your life? Or do you just look at it simply as just a chapter in your life that you went through? How would you uh, answer that? Well, I think, I think that it, it uh, instilled in me uh, a greater feeling of independence. I think I always felt very independent after serving in the service, which I wouldn't have felt before. Hmm. And also, uh, uh, perhaps uh, it, it uh, helped me in evaluation of other people. Being around so many different people over such a long period of time, uh, I think that I was better able to evaluate people, which was it a certain advantage to me in my in the business world mm -hmm. and not only was I a banker but primarily I, I lent money and uh, I averaged over a hundred loans a month for 20 years wow. and I didn't collect it all but uh, I made a lot of good friends over that period of time mm. and it, of course uh, just like Warfare banking has changed now too. You don't find anyone sitting in the bank waiting for a car loan anymore. Mm, wow. <laughs> but I, I, I really, as I look back, I'm glad I had that service experience. Yeah, very good. good. I, I, I have been very fortunate through my life. Oh, wonderful! That's wonderful. Well, on that note, we'll uh, we'll close down this interview. I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. This photo uh, was taken either at uh, the end of my ROTC program or when I started well, I guess it's a little later because it looks like an Air Force emblem on the shoulder. So by that time, I was a second lieutenant in the Air Force. Hmm. That picture was when I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. So you were in, uh, awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross? Yes. And, and I believe also some <laughs> air medals, correct? Well, I had the Air Medal and two clusters. And I think it was seven battle stars and the Distinguished Flying Cross. Well, I'm glad we brought that up because I forgot to ask you about fortunate that. Fortunate to be awarded them. Wow, uh, yeah, what an honor. This is my C-47 crew. Notice 6B on the fuselage. And so, uh, so it would be a crew of five that you flew with? 
Yes. Okay. Pilot, co-pilot, crew chief, radio operator, and I don't know who the last one was on this trip. And I think it, uh, uh, when I was watching the, the, the footage you had recorded with your, uh, with your camera, uh, you had named your plane, right? Did you? Well. Uh, or one, at one point, did you have a, a plane that was named? It was named uh, the crew chiefs at one point in our life of our airplane all painted names on their pilot's airplane. Uh -huh. We had no choice in the name, <laughs> they did it. Uh -huh. But uh, little Abner comics were in vogue at that time. Uh -huh. So that's where the names came from. Oh, okay. And Hairless Joe was one of the, <laughs> yeah, so that fit me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hairless Joe, the C-47, that was named for me, and it's the one I flew from from uh, Indiana until the end of the war. Hmm. And then down here is just an example of a, a yes. C-47? Uh-huh. Hmm. On leave in England, we ventured into a photographic studio. Is this some of the guys you served with? Yes. Yeah. And as that's, far as I know, they're all gone now. And that's you in the lower right, uh, left-hand corner, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Typical letter from my wife. Let's see if we can zoom in on it. All is well at home. Hope to see you soon. God bless you and keep, keep, and keep you safe, Mrs. Harry Beale. Hmm. <laughs> the picture of my wife and daughter, with a daughter that I didn't see until she was almost two years old. Wow. How old were, uh, uh, how long did it take you to find out she would have been born? Was there, did they get word to you pretty quick on that? I, I think so, but yeah. I don't remember. Oh, okay. The E6B computer, that was uh, the way we navigated, uh, especially down low to the ground, and we could put in time, distance, wind, and uh, it worked quite well for us at that time. I'll be darned. 